Hey guys, welcome back to a new video by Biology Resumption. So today we are going to run through the Cambridge IGCSE Biology Paper 4 Theory Extended, the February-March 2024 Paper 4 Variant 2. So let's start off with this paper. If there are any questions, please drop down in the comment section below. Alright, let's begin. Question 1. Enzymes are catalysts. A part 1 says describe what is meant by the term catalyst. Pay attention to what the question want. They want catalyst. So most of the time we always say a uh, biological catalyst. Okay, now they want catalyst. So you must mention that a substance which increases the rate of reaction. So this is the general definition that we always know. You cannot have a biological substance. It has to be a substance which increases the rate of reaction. Then there's, you need one more mark. One more mark is that where there will be no permanent changes by the reaction. Meaning, if I have something, right? Okay, if I have an enzyme, okay, and then this is probably the substrate, the enzyme won't change anything. The enzyme will only increase the reaction to produce more of the products. That is the key thing. Okay, so there will be no changes. In fact, no permanent changes happen by the reaction itself. It only increases it. Okay, all right. Part two, enzymes are proteins. State the name of the chemical elements found in all proteins. So they give, this is really simple. They've given you proteins. So proteins will need to have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. So one mark will happen to be on CHO. Another one mark is coming from nitrogen. All right. So if you understand all of these, you should be getting four marks. Okay. B. Lipase is an enzyme found in the human digestive system. So figure 1.1, they shows you the effect of pH on the percentage of uh, on the percentage activity of the lipase. So most of the time we have been seeing a temperature graph, okay, which happens to be quite similar. So this time they have given you a pH. So a pH graph, you must uh, take an eye look on the effect of it. So the question wants you to describe and explain the change in percentage activity of the lipase shown on figure 1.1. So this question is six marks and they've given you two things that they want is a describe and an explanation. So if this is the strategy, we usually um, split to three describe, three explain. So from the graph itself, okay, let's look at the graph. You can see that the, end, the reaction really started at about pH 4. So generally, in the first half, we split up, okay? We split this. So at pH 3 or at a lower pH, you can see pH 4 and pH 10, the activity is much lower. But after pH 4 onwards, meaning as the pH increases, the activity also increases. They increase to the point where there's a peak and that peak is at pH 7. After that, because of the in further increase of the pH, what happens that this causes the enzyme activity to decrease again. So they sharply decrease and as the pH continues to go on, it stops, meaning the enzyme has already denatured. So these are the few things that I have told you and you should be putting your explanation in this way. So my describe is that there is zero activity at approximately pH 3 and after pH 10.2. Then you can see the enzyme activity increases to a peak which I mentioned is at pH 7 and then it decreases again. You can also state that the optimum pH of this reaction is at pH 7. So I got three points. And now for explanation. Why the change of pH will cause the increase of the activity or decrease the activity? One reason is because of the active site. The active site changes as the pH changes. So this is how it works. So at optimum pH, 
there will be the most enzyme substrate complexes form. This is definitely because the enzyme is working at its peak, is at its at its best. So they will produce more products out. So lower pH and higher pH will definitely cause the enzyme denaturation. Enzyme denaturation shows that the change of active site of the enzyme. And then what happens if the uh, active site of the enzyme changes? There will be no substrate able to fit into the active site complementary again. So these are one more point that I can also add for explanation. Okay? So C part 1, complete the word equation to show the substrate and products for lipase. So lipase is an enzyme deriving from the word lipid. So what would be my reactant? My reactant would be the fats or the oils. Okay, these two are both accepted. And when the lipase enzyme acts on the fats and the oils, they will split into two products, fatty acid and glycerol. Make sure you do not uh, be confused by glycerol and glycogen. These two terms are different. Glycerol is a product produced from fat. Glycogen is a sugar. Okay, this is a carbohydrate which is found in human. In human. Okay, very important. Part two. Lipase acts in the duodenum. Okay, so they told you that in the duodenum, there is a lipase enzyme. Explain how the body provides a suitable pH for lipase activity. Okay, now let me ask, what is the general pH or like, what do you know in duodenum? What is the pH that, you know, you, if you can, if you have read your materials, it the pH should be about an alkali pH. In alkaline condition, actually. So, in order for fats, right? Fats is not really uh, digested in the stomach. It has to be broken down. And that mixture, which also has an alkaline condition, is the bile. Okay, three marks for this question. What you can do is that if you remember how bile is produced, it is produced from the liver. And after the liver produces the bile, if there's no fats, it will be in storage. Where it will be stored? It will be stored in the gallbladder. And when there's fats arriving in the duodenum, the bile from the gallbladder will be secreted out and then they will undergo the emulsification and then it, at the same time, it will help to neutralize the acidic chyme. Chyme is a liquid already. Basically, after the stomach acid acts on the food, it's already start to be liquid form. And that is called as chyme. And the chyme is acidic. And you know the duodenum cannot handle very acidic condition because its layers is not suited for it. So therefore, the bowel will neutralize that acidic condition of that kind then it's able to work at its optimum condition okay question two figure 2.1 shows the cross section of a human heart so show you very basic okay this is a uh, that this is a heart and then a part one figure 2.1 label with an r of the position of the right ventricle okay in this kind of a diagram right the, the how we view the left and right is opposite from what uh, what we see this is not the left this is the right and the next side is the left it inverts each other when this kind of image shows you this is a cross section okay so we are looking from uh, as an outside perspective to the heart Okay, so now they want you to label R on the position of the ventricle. The top part is always the atrium. The chamber on the top is the atrium. The chamber at the bottom, which has the thickest muscles, always the ventricles. So the right ventricle is not so thick as the left ventricle. Therefore, it's here. And remember, your line, right, is not an arrowhead. Do not do that. In bio, we need to see this line. Just point directly with a ruler and label it as R. Okay? 
Part 2. State the names of the structured label A and B on figure 2.1. Let's look at A. A, right, you can see these two, you know, some kind of like elastic, like some kind of fibers like that. And this fiber is attached onto the left ventricle. This one is a valve because blood, right, they, if the blood enters, the valves have to close so that they prevent the blood from going backwards. So this valve in between the atrium and the ventricle is the atrial ventricular valve. And after the blood has been filled up here already, right, it has to go up and then to the rest of the body. This valve is called the semilunar valve. All right. Part three, complete the sentence uh, about blood vessel C. Okay, blood vessel C, in fact, transport blood from the left ventricle. You can see from the direction, this is the left. So if you know that this is the thickest layer, right? You might know that the vessel is an artery. And this artery, they will transport blood from the left ventricle to the rest of the body. And if you didn't put rest of the body, you can also put as different organs, but the organ has to be named. Okay, it has to be like transport to the um, kidney, to the liver. Okay, you must provide specific answers. Okay. Question B. Figure 2.2 shows a cross section of part of a heart that has incomplete structure. Okay, so the question wants to explain how the incomplete heart structure uh, shown in figure 2.2 may affect a person's ability to transport oxygen. So coming back is another cross section and this time they label you this is an atria. So this is the right atria, this is the left atria. Okay, and in the middle, there's something missing. In fact, this is the septum. This one, what's the septum's role is to separate the oxygenated and the deoxygenated blood. So this type of question is what we know as an application question. And in fact, when the septum is not there, in a medical term is septum perforation. And it's quite serious actually. So now we answer this question question where they say when there is this incomplete heart structure how can it affect the person to transport the oxygen so the context they want to answer this question is how can it affect the transportation of oxygen so in the diagram you must mention that there is a hole in the septum you kind of know that there's a hole because it's between the right side and the left side so which provides a connection or a passageway between the left, band, the left atrium and the right atrium. Then, the effects of that hole is that it allows the mixture of the oxygenated blood and the deoxygenated blood to mix together. And what happens if they mix together is the, the oxygenated blood is much lesser. And then when it arrives in the tissue, right, it's much lower because oxygenated blood is needed for respiring tissue, less distribution of the oxygenated blood to the tissue because of that mixture, okay? Question C. Figure 2.3 shows how the body uses aerobic and anaerobic respiration during the first 120 seconds of vigorous physical activity. Between 0 and 20 seconds, the body also uses stored energy. So they give you a graph, okay? The two graphs shows uh, aerobic respiration and the graph shows the anaerobic respiration. So part one, they say describe data shown in figure 2.3. So when they ask you to describe, just look the graph. What can you see from the curve? Synthesize them and write in a paragraph. And this is four marks. So how are you going to explain? We explain for what you can see in general from the start at t equals to zero second. At t equals to zero second, both aerobic and anaerobic respiration increases in the beginning. This is fixed. But then you can see that after zero second, what happens to anaerobic respiration? It has a sharp, rapid increase. See, look at how much it's increased in just 20 seconds. 
but for aerobic respiration, it did not increase this rapidly. In fact, it increases gradually. So these words, right, like increase, sharp, rapid increase, gradually increases. These are the terms that you need to use when describing the curve of a, of a graph given, of a diagram given. Then after t equals to 20 seconds, what happens? You can see the anaerobic respiration graph is going down. So you can say there is a decrease in the anaerobic respiration. And then at t equals to 102, t equals to 120 seconds, what happens between here? It remains the same. And you know that as aerobic respiration increases, it remains at that, uh, that peak. It didn't change, it didn't went down, it didn't went up again. It remains stationary. Okay, so that is for, for marks. Part two, state the balanced chemical equation for aerobic respiration. So this should be easy. So one mark for the general uh, equation, your understanding with the glucose and the oxygen produce the carbon dioxide and the water, but this time they want balance. So you have to use your chemical uh, knowledge to balance up the equation, okay? Part three, during anaerobic respiration, oxygen depth can build up. So state the name, the chemical that causes the oxygen depth. So they say chemical. So chemical is not a gas and do not put carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is not the one that will cause the oxygen depth. The oxygen depth is caused by the chemical lactic acid. That is a chemical. So it's very important that you see the word chemical because it can differ between carbon dioxide and lactic acid. So the answer is lactic acid. Okay, question 3a, coordination response in plants. Figure 3.1 shows a growing plant. The plant is growing in the dark. So part 1 says state the name of the growth response shown by the plant shoot in figure 3.1. So they say in the plant shoot, you can see that it's growing down. And you can also see that it's growing in the dark. So when it's not growing in the dark, phototropis, uh, phototropism is rejected a lot of people they never read the question on the top they will imagine that there is a sun here and it makes sense the plant shoot is growing towards light but now it says it's growing in the dark so this is going towards gravity so they say state the name of the growth response gravitropism or geotropism both are accepted okay Part 2. Explain how the growth of the plant shoot in figure 3.1 is controlled. This question has been repeated multiple, multiple times in past year paper. It is to show that how did this response is stimulated. And this response is stimulated by a hormone, auxin. Auxin is produced from the shoot tip. This is the first point, the tip of the shoot. So remember this diagram we've always seen in the textbook? And then something like that. Well, maybe uh, shoot that something like this. Okay, oxygen is produced here. This is first point. And after oxygen is produced, how, where did it go? It will diffuse down. In fact, it would, when the oxygen is produced here, it will diffuse down to here. It will diffuse down to the shaded side of the shoot. And what happens if once the shaded side of the shoot, it starts to and stimulate the cell elongation to keep on build up, build up, build up, and continues to go against and go towards the response that it, it, that it should be going. So this is the answer, okay? So B, plant roots growing towards water is another growth response. So state two uses of water in plant. So another general answer that I mentioned in my previous video is that when you see plant, the first point to guarantee a mark is that it acts as a solvent, first mark. Second one is that you can mention that it helps to uh, retain the turgidity, okay, uh, for supporting the tissues, um, at acting as a transport medium because you know osmosis will occur, and then you can also say it's a reactant in photosynthesis because it needs water in order to produce glucose and the oxygen. So these are the answers that you can do. Link back to what the question one. Plant roots, oh, towards water. Water is the key word that they need, okay? So C, a student measured the root length of a bean seedling uh, over a period of 
120 hours. Okay, so figure 3.2 shows the result. Now they say that calculate the percentage increase. Okay, now they want percentage increase. So this always guarantee one question coming out for this uh, in this paper four. Root length between 48 hours and 96 hours and give your answer in two decimal places. This one mark typically. Okay, so now let's find between 48 hours and 96 hours. Then we only sub into the formula. So 48 hours, just very easy. Use a pencil, draw a line, okay? And this should be 9. For 96, it's quite easy. Just look here. And you know this is about 25, okay? So you're going to sub into the formula. What's the formula for a percentage increase is final minus initial value divided by the initial value times 100 so you sub in 25 minus 9 divided by that by 9 times 100 you should be getting this answer round off you get 78 so 177.78 percent is your correct answer okay question 4 this is a reproductive system Figure 4.1 shows the concentration of female sex hormones during the menstrual cycle. So they've given you the, en the entire menstrual cycle together with the hormones that acts, the relationship of the hormones between it. Okay, So you must be able to differentiate when this hormone will begin to spike, Okay, something like that. So the first question says that identify the figure 4.1 hormone R. Hormone R, okay, let's analyze the graph, right? So the hormone R will increase and then it also, you know, it's still quite high during ovulation also. And that is the estrogen. Okay, the estrogen always works like this and then it decreases as progesterone increases. Okay, so it always takes over. So FSH, once it decreases, it allows the estrogen to increase. Then for S, this is the luteinizing hormone. The luteinizing hormone will need to, seek to help with the release of the ovum to the fallopian tube. So for R is estrogen, S is the luteinizing hormone or LH. So B, state the day or days of the menstrual cycle shown in figure 4.1 when ovulation is most likely to occur. It's always between 13 to 16 days or you can give one value, 14 days, acceptable. So it's always between when the luteinizing hormones begins to spike. Okay, and around 16 days is where it starts to decrease. Somewhere around here, peak is at 14 days. And then shedding of the uterine lining occurs. Shedding of the, means the uterine lining or the uterine wall begins to break down. And this happens at the beginning of the menstrual cycle. After the progesterone has increases, then menstruation occurs, the endometrium lining or the uterine lining will start to break down. So this breaks down at the start. Day one to day eight, or you can always put one, one number, day one, acceptable, okay? C. Describe how the concentration of progesterone would change during pregnancy. Give a reason for this change. So concentration of progesterone during pregnancy. So it's around this point. Day 17 to day 28. And it works at its peak about here. So you need to ask yourself, what is the role of this progesterone? So the progesterone, of course, if you can see from the graph, it increases. Uh, then what the role is to maintain the thickening of the uterine walls or the endometrium you know to allow the implantation to occur because pregnancy right the fetus the, the fetus is there already and the fetus needs to be implanted and without the thickening of the uterine the uterus wall right how can how is it able to implant there's no placenta the placenta can't even grow up so that's the reason to maintain the thickened um, uterine wall okay d state the sites of production of progesterone during a menstrual cycle and during pregnancy they say during a menstrual cycle when is progesterone produced progesterone is produced from the corpus luteum okay corpus luteum is you know uh it's in the ovarian 
where the ovary starts to you know release out then it starts to change or start to degenerate then it will start to produce from the corpus luteum during pregnancy it will be from the ovaries or from the placenta the placenta will continue to maintain the, the walls okay and describe the role of the FSH in the menstrual cycle, uh, menstrual cycle. What's the role of the follicle stimulating hormone? So you can see from the word, it helps to mature and also to develop the follicles, or you can see develop the ovaries, and it also helps to stimulate the ovaries to release the estrogen. Okay, so that is the answer. Okay. Okay, question 5, figure 5.1 shows part of a monkey flower plant and they say A part 1 state 2 pieces of evidence and it's visible, okay, visible, meaning from this, you must find the visible one. If you cannot see color, do not state color because you cannot see what's the color of this plant. And they say that show that the monkey flower plants are pollinated by insects. So, by insect, insect pollinated plants, they always have petals which are large in size. Don't just write petals. Colorful petals are not even accepted also. Why? Because you cannot see colors. They want visible. So large petal is the only answer. Then spotted patterns. You can see that those are so many dots, right? These dots are the form of like attracting the insects to come close to the plant to start pollinating them. So these are the two rather easier answers that I can think of. Okay. So part two, they say the monkey flower plant in the figure 5.1 reproduce sexually. So this is sexual reproduction. And describe the advantages uh, and disadvantages of the sexual reproduction for monkey flower plants. Four marks question for both things, advantages and disadvantages, I will split into two. So I would give two points for advantage, two points for disadvantage. So sexual reproduction happens in us humans also. So when sexual reproduction occurs, you know that this produces genetic variation. There's a different, you know, different, uh, ch different child, you know, this relates to the flower. It increases the genetic variation. And what's the good thing about the gen genetic variation being increased? It's less susceptible for, uh, to disease because your DNA and the person's DNA next to you is always different. So it's less likely to be attacked by diseases. Otherwise, the disease can basically read every same DNA and this may cause more diseases. And then when you have a genetic variation, your adaptability is so much better. Okay, that's the advantages. The disadvantages is more of talking about how so much work need to be done. Why? Because for sexual reproduction, you need to have two parents or, the, or this flower needs to find a mate. And then more energy is needed for fertilization to occur. And then it needs pollinators. Without pollinators, how can you go from one place to another? You can't. So that's why sexual reproduction requires pollinators. Okay. B. Monkey flower plants were introduced uh, to Europe from North America about 200 years ago. Scientists measured the leaf area of five monkey plants growing in Europe and five monkey plants growing in North America. So their results are shown in table 5.1 and table 5.2. So you can see the difference. And then the part one says using the data in table 5.2, calculate the mean leaf area for the plants growing in North America. So give your answer as a whole number and include the unit. So they want a mean. I think you know what is mean, right? Add up all of these and divide by 5. And you get 301 centimeter square. If you're wondering where to get the unit from, it's here. You must add the unit or you get minus one mark. All right. Part two, state the conclusion. A conclusion is what you have been doing in paper six. Compare between this table 5.2 and table 5.1. What can you see? You can see that the mean and of the European plant and the mean in the North America is so much different. So you can say that the plants in the Europe have a much greater leaf area than the plants in North America. Done. One mark. Okay. Part 3. Ancestor of monkey flower plants had a much smaller leaf area and how the monkey flower plants have developed a large leaf area over time. So you can see that they give you two clues on what is the word that you need to explain. This one is definitely about selection. But what kind of selection is this? So you can see is how it becomes from a smaller leaf area to a larger leaf area over time. 
over time, meaning it takes a much longer time. So the key word for this is natural selection. Natural selection takes a lot, a lot of generations. So it happens within the population where there is variation occurs. And what happens if variation occurs? There is always competition. The competition for food, competition for space, and then this allows the weaker ones having a much more struggle to survive. And then, of course, the ones with a larger leaf area will survive better than a much smaller leaf area. Therefore, the allele for that large leaf area will be passed down to the offspring and the process of this repeats for many, many generations because one generation takes a long time. Many generations means over a longer time. So that's the keyword that they want, okay? 6a, figure 6.1 shows part of the carbon cycle in the ocean. So part 1 says phytoplankton contains chlorophyll. So chlorophyll is one of the keywords that link to photosynthesis. So explain how the phytoplankton can lower the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. In the carbon cycle, the only process that decreases the carbon dioxide concentration from the surrounding is photosynthesis. So link back to this question, phytoplankton is a form of producer. And this is where the CO2 is absorbed for the photosynthesis to produce the sugars and everything. That's it. Then part two, suggest the role of the zooplankton in this ecosystem. You can see the zooplankton eating krill feces and feces is a waste product. So you know that a waste product shows that the zooplankton is a decomposer and where it feeds on the waste organic material. That's it. This is how you link, you know, you link with your understanding of what feces basically poop. So poop is a waste product. We, ex we, uh, we of course, ingest feces. So once you ingest feces, the decompose, you feed on it. Okay. And then state part three, which two, which of the two processes, which adds the CO2 to the surrounding. Very simple decomposition, combustion means burning, uh, burning, you know, once you burn stuff, you release the CO2 to the surrounding. One more is respiration. And part four, they say describe the effect of environment of additional CO2 in the ecosystem or in the atmosphere. So I think this is very common sense. What happens if there's many CO2 in your surrounding? Because CO2 is a greenhouse gas. And once the greenhouse gas reaches to the atmosphere, this will trigger global warming. This is how you link. And then global warming will enhance that greenhouse effect. And then this greenhouse effect can have significant, significant impact on the biodiversity around us. There will be a loss of biodiversity, um, you know, loss of habitat by the organism living there, and then many, many more. Then drought, flooding, this will occur. And then B, figure 6.2 shows the pyramid of energy for a food chain and e ocean ecosystem. On figure 6.2, label the trophic level containing herbivores. Okay, what is a pyramid of energy? Pyramid energy, there's only one thing you know. Pyramid energy will decrease as, as the trophic level increases. What, what does it mean by this? Trophic level increases, uh, the, as the trophic level increases, the pyramid energy becomes smaller because from your knowledge, you know that the producers usually have the most energy because it's coming directly from the sun, it has the most energy. Herbivores will be second. Okay, why? Because the herbivores eats most of the energy from the plant. And then as it goes higher and higher, less energy is being received by that trophic level. So you can see from here very obvious that herbivores are at the second box. Okay? And part two, why the pyramid energy usually have fewer than five trophic level? This is a very common question and you should know that energy it will be lost between the trophic levels by so many metabolic processes like respiration, excretion, so movement, ejection, okay? And then you can also add on that only 10% of the energy is transferred from one trophic level to another trophic level. Three marks, that's it. So part three, this is two advantages of using a pyramid of energy rather than a pyramid of biomass to represent a food chain. So a pyramid energy is 
most of the time is triangu- triangular shape, but that's not the advantage. The advantage is that you can see how the energy transfer is occurred. You know 10% only transfer, right? You can compare from this trophic level to another trophic level, it has in- decreased. So that's how you can see the actual energy transfer. The second one is to compare the ecosystem. You can compare the ecosystem between the marine ecosystem and then in the forest ecosystem. You can see that it's also about the same. As the organism becomes bigger and bigger, they become a much like a predator, the, the amount of energy they receive is very little already. Okay? And then C, the ocean contains fish stock that can be managed as sustainable resource to provide food for humans. State is what is meant by sustainable resource. So this is the definition that you must know. Okay, and it is meant by producing rapidly as it being used so that it doesn't run out. Sustainable resource, ma. sustainable means to for a longer time, and resource is the current uh, raw resources that we have. Is that as the resource is being used up, it needs to be produced faster so that, that we must not have a scarce of that resource. Okay. Last part, fishing can be managed to promote conservation of fish stocks. Explain one way. Okay, very simple. I just pick two randomly. You can say close season to stop that fishing. Why is to allow more fish to breed in that area. Second one, quota. Quota, you can prevent overfishing. What's another one? Very common, education. Education encourage people to not to overfish. Another one is to protect the area, to allow the small, you know, uh, fishes to grow quick faster so that it helps to restock the fish naturally itself. You can control the net types, to control the net types so that they don't catch the small fishes, instead they will catch the bigger fish. And then monitoring, have rules, have legislation which helps to control the stocks, prevent that overfishing again. Alright, that's it. So thank you for watching this video. I hope you understand with a rather deeper explanation in this video. So thank you so much for watching. See you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.